So we will get started. My name is Stephanie Keeler. I am the Community Program Coordinator for the Riverwood Conservancy. Um, if you watch these webinars before, normally we have somebody else joining us. Um, normally Rashid's here with me today and he is uh, letting me do it all on my own. So hopefully everything goes as planned and hopefully my Wi-Fi um, hangs in there for us as well. Um, today, our theme is obviously Valentine's Day. So it will be, will you be my Valentine? And we'll be talking all about mating rituals and courtship in animal species. I've mainly edited it down to just species that you can find here in Mississauga and within Ontario. Um, but I know so many other really cool stories from species around the world. So if you guys would like a, a second part to this, I'd be happy to do that because there was so much information. Um, a lot of the information I actually uh, remembered from was from this book here it's called headless males make great lovers and it's by marty crump it is a really really cool book it's not only about mating rituals in any means but it's about weird animal behaviors from around the world so um uh it's a really cool book if you are interested in this um so i will share my screen here um and there we go. So welcome. Thank you so much again for everyone joining me today. Um, a special thanks today goes out to Dave Taylor, who is our resident wildlife photographer, naturalist and teacher. He is all around skilled guy. Um, so a lot of his photography is in this webinar today. So I just want to say thank you to him and all of the videos that are in this webinar are Dave's as well. And then my second thank you goes out to Credit Valley Conservation because without them, we would not be able to do any of these kinds of events. They are a great support for us. So thank you, CBC. And I just have one little plug. If you do have the financial means to support us today with a donation, um, we would really greatly appreciate it to keep our programs up and running. Um, and you can donate at the riverwoodconservancy.org. And thank you everyone for joining me today. Let's get into it. So like I said, there was a lot of information um, that we had to <laughs> go over today. So I, I edited it down to just these four things and um, hopefully I do them justice. I picked the kind of coolest species that I thought would fit into each category. The first one will be going over courtship, which is like the most basic form of mating rituals that animals go through. Um, then we have sneakers and satellite males, which are a very interesting um, species for sure. And then we'll do a, a topic on till death do us part. Um, I picked one animal species and you can guess in the comments below what animal species this is, but it's basically um, an animal that dies after finding a mate. And then the last one we'll be going over today is mimicry. So first we are going over courtship. And courtship often is shown in a couple different ways. Uh, this can be an auditory courtship, so calling, um, making noises. It can be a visual courtship, like these uh, wild turkeys here, they fan out those big tails. Often these males are also um, making gobbling sounds while they're doing this. These two males are competing for a female. And often this is the, the case in the animal kingdom that the males have to compete against each other for the selection of a mate. The females are the ones that are very choosy. They pick the male that's either the largest or the most handsome or the brightest colors or makes the loudest call. So the females kind of just sit back and watch the males compete with each other and watch their courtship displays and decide who is the best pick for their mate. So this is often seen in the bird kingdom. Lots of birds show beautiful colors on their feathers. Um, so these are a few of my favorite that actually you can find here at Riverwood, but around the world as well. Um, the top left is the yellow warbler. The bottom left is the black Bernian warbler, which is my all time favorite warbler. It comes in the springtime. It's so beautiful and deep orange colors on its throat. Um, the top right is our indigo bunting and the bottom right is our famous resident bird species, the northern cardinal. So all of these are the males of the birds and they're brightly colored. They're trying to attract a mate. And if you think about it, it doesn't really make sense for females of this of these species to be brightly colored. Often the females are dull and they're brown and they're not very impressive looking. 
And the reason being is these males are going to the top of trees. They're singing super loudly. They're brightly colored and they're not only attracting females, but they're attracting predators to them as well. So the females don't benefit from being brightly colored. They kind of want to camouflage into the forest. They want to be light brown and quiet, whereas the males are trying to attract the, their, their female companion. But at the same time, they may be in um, danger of being picked off by a hawk nearby or something like that, too. And so those are all visual kind of courtship displays. But if you come here in the springtime to Riverwood, or if you um, go even in your backyard or off your balcony um, in the springtime, you'll often hear many noises as well. So bird species make all different types of noises to attract mates and here at Riverwood we have 180 bird species in our peak season which is about summer um, before the migrants go back south uh, but not all 180 are singing obviously at the same time many of them don't sing many of them um, are nocturnal uh, but there's a lot a lot of sound going on in the springtime and all of these different chimes and, and songs that they're singing to attract a mate it's pretty impressive and once you get really good at birding, you could go out in the springtime and just listen and you can actually identify different species that are singing just based on their unique song, which is really, really cool to do. One of my favorite bird songs and my favorite bird um, pairs, I would say, are the common loons. Common loons are a great example of nature's love. Um, they do this really cool courtship display where they, they go high up on their feet in the water and they flap their wings. And they're both doing it this at the exact same time with each other and singing to each other. So it, it's pretty romantic looking. I will say that they also have a really good communication line with each other. So if you've ever been camping at night or you've been out at night um, near a lake and you hear that, that long, Ooh, loon call. That's actually a loon calling to its mate and saying, where are you? I can't find you. Where are you on this lake? And often they will reply. It's the same if they lose their chick on the lake or something like that. They'll actually sing that really long haunting call to find where their mate is, which is it's pretty cute, I would say. But it's not just birds that do courtship displays. And often that's the first thing that comes to mind is birds and mammals that do courtship displays, but other animals do as well. And in particular, probably one of the coolest courtship displays is done by this one here. This is called a yellow garden spider. They are huge spiders, so beautiful. I think they're beautiful. Maybe other people think they're kind of creepy looking, which I completely understand. Um, but this one here is the female bright yellow and black colors really cool design she's huge and she's kind of hanging out in the middle of her web and whenever she feels a slight vibration on her web she'll run over and attack whatever came to her web which can be quite difficult if you were a male yellow garden spider like this one here so on the left here you're looking at the underside of a female and on the right that is a male, very tiny, almost three times smaller than the female is. And if you were a male and you're super small and you're kind of approaching this female thinking, oh, is she going to attack me? They need some way to kind of um, tell that spider that I'm not food, I'm a mate, and I would love if you would let me to come on your web. So what they do is I like to say they kind of play like a little harp. So these spiders will use their front feet and they'll string the web in a certain vibration. They'll string the web and they basically play a little tune for the female to say, I'm not food, I am a mate. I'm not food, I'm a mate. And if she likes the, the tune that the, the spider is playing, then she'll let it on its web and they'll become mates. But it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes that male still ends up as food for the female. 
Um, another thing spider species do is some some of them wave their hands up like this at the edge of their web and say, hey, would you let me come on your web? Um, it's pretty cute what they do. And another weird courtship display um, comes from our Midland painted turtles. Um, this one here basking in the sunshine. I can't wait for summertime when we can start basking outside in the sunshine again. I miss it. But what these turtles do is they have really long fingernails. So this is actually a male that has really long fingernails. One second. And what they do with these fingernails is they actually, similar to what the spiders do, they vibrate the water in a certain way and then they wipe their fingernails on the cheeks of the females to see if she's interested in being a mate. And if she is, then great, they'll be mates. And if she's not, she will chase them off and she will tell them, don't come near me anymore. So the female's fingernails will be about half the size or half the length of the males here. And I like to um, think of it kind of like a song and more romantic. So this is actually one of our turtles that we have on site. We have five red-eared slider turtles. And um, this is one of them with the really pretty green eyes. Those cool and limpid green eyes are cool where in my love lies. So deep that in my searching. I just think that's really funny. <laughs> and the next thing we have is our sneaker males and satellite males. <coughs> Um, if you know what these are, please put it down in the chat because this is my all time favorite um, courtship display. So I am going to ask you guys a question and I want you guys to type in the Q&A chat or in the regular chat and see if you know what this call is. Does anyone recognize that? I'll play it one more time. I hear, I see somebody saying toads, frogs, spring peeper, toad, question mark. So if you said toad, you are exactly right. Here, one second. I want to play the video one second. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. And it is. So this is the American toad. They stand up really tall. They pop out their, their throat as much as possible and they sing and they're singing to attract mates. Similarly, many amphibians and frogs in particular do this sound. They make vocal sounds just like birds do. And this is to attract a certain mate. Now, one more question. What do you think this is? If that was an American toad. What do you think that is? I'll play one more time. Did anyone? Frog, a broken whistle. I like that, Lisa. So this one in particular is a very, very small frog and it's called a spring peeper. So I was driving down my road, a road near my house one day and I had all my windows up and I could hear this blaring peeping sound and I knew immediately it was the spring peeper. So they come out really early in the springtime and they're so loud. There'll be hundreds of these frogs singing in this little tiny vernal pool trying to attract a mate. And often the males will be high up like the toad was singing. This one's even holding onto a reed to get good traction and singing very loud and being, being very proud of their song. But there's some frogs that are called sneaker males or satellite males that kind of ruin the whole system. What these sneaker males do is they'll hunker down, they'll be tiny and they'll be flat and they'll hide in the reeds. They'll go near the males that are singing really loud and they'll hide right beside those males and they'll, they'll be disguised basically underneath the water. And they'll wait for those males to attract other females and then these males will come out of nowhere and intercept and say, yep, that was me who was singing. And they'll actually steal the mates of the other frogs. 
the benefit of doing this is if you're not singing, you're not using any energy as well. When you're hidden, you're not attracting any predators to you. So basically you have the best of both worlds. You're not going to be eaten and you're not using any energy. And all of these males are singing super loud to attract a mate. And then you just sneak in and steal their mate, which is pretty incredible. Often the frogs that are doing this are smaller. They don't have a lot of resources and they're not as impressive as the other males. And I like to say they're kind of like incognito. They're wearing glasses and a little hat and hidden. Now the next part is called till death do us part. And I wanted to know, does anyone know what this fish is jumping high in these rapids? Anybody know what this guy is? A salmon, salmon. Awesome, yeah, salmon, everybody got it, that's great. Yeah, so this is a salmon, in particular, this is called a Chinook salmon. Probably one of the most strenuous mating rituals that I've ever witnessed. And that is because these males, they travel from Lake Ontario, which is a very deep, cold lake that has tons of resources for these really large males and females. They'll live about three to four years in Lake Ontario. And then they have an instinctual um, motivation to migrate back up the Credit River, which where they were born. So there'll be hundreds of these salmons migrating up the Credit River in the fall. And all of them are in search of a mate. So there'll be so many of these things and they all start changing drastically. They start to turn different colors. Some of them are red, some of them are dark brown. A lot of salmon start to change their jaws. So the males actually get a hooked jaw, which is called a kipe. And this is in order to attract a mate, but also to fight off and defend against other males. And you can see in this image here, on the left is the ocean phase which in Chinook salmon, Chinooks can actually live in both saltwater and freshwater. So Chinooks live in um, Lake Ontario, but you can see on the left, all of those salmons look very similar. They're gray, not too impressive, but when they go to the spawning phase, which is what, when they're mating, they have these red colors, these darker colors. And you can see on the coho salmon in particular, how hooked their jaw is, that kipe is huge. And I always think that the sockeye salmon, how red their bodies get in order to attract a mate, it's really, really impressive. Now this one here, this is a Chinook salmon. They're a little bit less impressive than the other salmons, but they still go a really long journey up the Credit River. They turn kind of dark brownish colored. Once they enter the Credit River, they no longer eat, are eating any food. There's no food resources for them. And also now they're living in very shallow, warm waters. You can imagine compared to Lake Ontario, that's super deep and cold. Now they're in like two feet of water in, in um, the Credit River. It's really, really warm. Um, so they're, they're migrating up the Credit River for many days. They're no longer eating. They're in warm waters and they're also fighting off other um, mates. So they're fighting off males and, and females as well. This one in particular, I think is a female because her, her jaw is very blunt, as you can see, and the males form some sort of a kipe, a, a hook jaw on them. So the females and the males are both stopped eating and they're in these bad conditions in the water. So basically these fish are decaying as they migrate up the Credit River in order to find a mate and lay their eggs. And once they do lay their eggs, it's unfortunate, but all, if, I would say about 99% of these salmon actually die after they lay their eggs. So if you were to come to Riverwood, Riverwood in late fall, you would see on the shorelines it'd be very smelly and a lot of these fish are on the shorelines dead. And you can see this one in particular, there's tons of those little stripes or, or cuts on the back of it. And that's actually from fighting other males. They have really sharp teeth and they defend each other against um, to, to get access to the mates. Now this may seem like a sad love story and it is a little bit sad, but you have to remember that this is part of the Chinook salmon's life cycle and the coho salmon as well. This is part of the life cycle to live for about four years in Lake Ontario, migrate all the way up the Credit River and restart that life cycle, lay those eggs and let those fish travel all the way back to Lake Ontario. As these fish are dying and are decaying, they are adding so much nutrients to our environment. 
in particular, lots of birds, galls and things like that flock to these areas, eating all of these fish. It's really good for the environment. And also whatever's left over breaks down into the river and it adds nutrients to our watershed. But not only that, the water that goes on, um, that flows down the Credit River is offering nutrients to trees that are on the shorelines of the Credit River as well with all of this decaying um, salmon. So it's a sad story, but it's pretty interesting as well. And they are very uh, devoted to um, passing on their generations. And we have a lot of great programs here at Riverwood that actually allow you to come up to the Credit River and we teach you all about salmon. So we have many school programs and also community programs. Um, that we can actually show you the Credit River and all the salmon that are kind of on the shorelines. As you see at my feet here, we have two female Chinook salmon. Now, um, right now, we obviously can't be on site. So cross our fingers that soon we'll be doing in-person safe programming once again. And the last thing we're going to be talking about today is mimicry. And uh, mimicry is one of the coolest things. And I have um, only two species that I'm going to be talking about for this portion. Um, I'm sure there's many, many more. There's even some animals, um, some salmon in particular, that the males will mimic females in order to um, not fight other males. So some salmon actually disguise themselves or change their colors slightly so that they look like a female and so that they don't have to fight off the other males. If they're smaller or less impressive, they can kind of sneak in there like the sneaker males do. So. I'm going to be talking about uh, fireflies here and many people are surprised when they see that this is what a firefly actually looks like. We often think they're just like little round cute insects. This guy's kind of cute, but many people are like, ooh, what's that? Um, fireflies are actually not flies. In fact, they're beetles. So that's why they kind of look like that. There are many species of fireflies and each of them have their own love language or their own communication, just like birds do. So they flash their abdomen in different ways in order to attract the proper species um, of female or male. So they have this communication with one another. The male will flash his abdomen and then the female will flash the abdomen and they'll be able to locate each other and actually find a mate. But there is one um, firefly species that's a little bit um, mean to the other fireflies and it's a carnivorous firefly species. And what it does is it actually um, knows the different flashes that these males will be doing and it will pretend to be a female of that species. So this other firefly will be pretending like, yeah, I'm a girl over here flashing the abdomen. And the male will fly in thinking that he just found a mate. And what happens is he gets eaten, unfortunately. So this is a carnivorous uh, firefly species that actually eats other firefly species by um, knowing their different love languages, which is pretty sad, but kind of cool. And the very last uh, species I'm going to be talking about today that mimics and something we often don't associate with mating rituals is this one here. And this is a red trillium. They're so, so beautiful. Now all flowers have to find a mate somehow, but they don't have legs, they don't have arms, they can't sing, they can't smell, they can't even see anything. So it's kind of weird when we think about it, how do they mate with each other? And that's all done through pollination. So as you see there in the middle of the, the red trillium, there's kind of those yellowy things and those are called stamen. And basically stamen are the male parts of a flower and they produce the pollen that attracts insects to pollinate them. So we often associate pollinators being like bees and butterflies and hummingbirds that come in for the nectar of the flower, but ultimately pollinate that flower and bring that pollen to another flower. The red trillium has a different way. It does not have any nectar to offer to any kind of pollinator. So instead, it puts off this really smelly smell. And if you've ever smelt a, a red trillium, you'll know it's not the greatest smell. And what it is, it smells sort of like decaying flesh. It's really gross smelling. It smells like a dead animal. But there's some insects that love the smell of dead animal because that means that there's a snack nearby. And this smell actually attracts little ants. So what happens is the ants will climb into the red trillium and they'll be looking around for a dead animal 
and then they'll leave. They'll say, hmm, there was no food there. But while they're looking around on the actual red trillium, they're pollinating. They're picking up the pollen on their arms or legs, their, their abdomen, their head. They're getting pollen all over them. And these ants leave after knowing that there's no dead animal nearby. And they go to another red trillium with all that pollen over the, from the first one. And they actually pollinate those flowers. So when it brings that pollen to another flower, that pollen goes on the female parts of the flower, which is called a pistil. And that actually creates a seed. And the seeds of the flower are basically a baby. And that baby will grow. And that's actually how they disperse all their different flowers. So it's pretty incredible the mimicry that this flower can do. Because if you think about it, flowers have never seen or smelt a dead animal before. So this is all through evolution that these flowers are able to do that, which is pretty incredible. Now that is all I have for my Valentine's Day special for today. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. I know this was kind of a shorter one. Um, I will take any questions now if I can just stop sharing and then I can take anybody's questions if you have them in the Q&A chat. If you have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A chat or you can put it in the chat bar. Jen said that was fun and very informative. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Could you? I'm looking if there was any in the past. Doesn't look like there's any questions coming in. Tiffany, it was very fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for joining us, Tiffany. How about mating rituals for monarchs? Jen asked. That's a really good question. So as monarchs are starting to come back, um, I'm hoping to do a monarch program because I absolutely love monarchs. Um, the monarchs are starting to migrate back soon. I think end of March, they start migrating from um, Mexico where they all kind of migrate all the way down and then they come part way up. They make it to around Texas is their first stop and then they mate there and actually that, that generation dies off. Um, with monarchs, you can tell them the difference by um, one main thing is that the males have that black kind of spot on the back underwing and the females don't have that. Now with butterflies, it's mostly pheromones that they are releasing. So basically like a powdery substance that we can't see. So they're releasing these pheromones and um, that attracts the mate. It's kind of like a smell that the, that the monarchs can um, attract. Now, uh, something very interesting. We had one monarch that we were raising um, at my old job that actually didn't grow properly. So some of these monarchs, they'll emerge from their chrysalis and they don't um, develop their wings properly, but we still thought like she had a chance. So we brought her outside um, and put her on a flower and instantly she was releasing pheromones to attract a mate and a male butterfly came in. It was it was only like five minutes and a male um, monarch butterfly actually could smell this female and came right in and was mating with her, which was pretty incredible. That's a great question. Fascinating presentation. Will you definitely visit Riverwood in fall to see the salmon? Yeah, join us whenever you can. Um, hopefully we will have uh, uh, more salmon walks and programs coming up, but you can always go with your family um, along the Credit River and, and see the salmon migration. It's really incredible. Question from Tiffany, can salmon live longer than four years? So in particular, um, Chinook salmon, they live about four years and that's when they kind of get that instinctional um, behavior to move up to the Credit River. Uh, I won't say that they can't live more than four years. That's kind of just the average. And I do know other salmon species like coho, I think is only three years. But other salmon species, like Atlantic salmon, I think can live a little bit longer, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But Chinook salmon, the average length is four years, and that's usually when they start coming back up the Credit River. Trilliums grow near me. Is there anything people can do to help with pollinating? Help with pollinating trilliums? That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest thing to do is leave your garden and your backyard as it is. And when I say that is try not to use things like pesticides or insecticides. Both of those things are going to kill off the insect species that are pollinating any of your plants. 
um, a lot of us see things like ants or beetles as being um, a pest. And often they are even moths. Moths are a huge pollinator, especially nocturnal pollinator. And we see those things as pests. But I really want to say like, that's the biggest thing you can help with pollination is try to stop using chemicals on your lawn um, that are actually killing off these pollinators that we don't ultimately want to kill off. And that wasn't our intention, but often that's what happens, right? Uh, I have a question here that says, do other spiders also use the harp? And yes, they do. There are other species that kind of use the harp um, mating ritual. And I told you about the one that also waves its hands in the air. I think a lot of them that actually create these webs, they do that kind of mating ritual. And the reason it being is that female spiders in most species are always much larger than the males. So they have to kind of either sneak up on her or they have to impress her in some way. And Jen asks, will this be recorded? It is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube and Facebook page probably either tonight or Monday morning. If there's any other questions? And I just like to point out too, um, Riverwood is offering um, school trips, class um, in-class school trips virtually right now. So if you want to um, book that, you can always email me. Um, we are also doing community and club presentations as well. If you have a community or club that you'd like to us to reach out to you. Um, in the spring, I find many frogs in the pool. I usually catch them on the net and let them loose in the garden. Is there a better solution? There is a really great product out there, um, which is kind of like a frog ladder and it's like a floating device and then it has a little ladder attached to the floating device so the frogs can climb up and climb out of the pool um really that is it, it is difficult to to keep your frogs out of there but if you buy one or two of those and put them on either end of the pool you will see lots of frogs actually using that and climbing out to get out of your pool but always you know going out with your net is a great way too Do you have any of those facts about mating in animals from around the world? I do. So um, I really tried to focus this presentation on mostly animals that you could find in Mississauga or in Ontario in general, but I could always do a follow-up presentation that has from animals around the world. If you were interested in that, that'd be great. Would you be talking about hummingbirds anytime soon? I think that'd be a really great um, presentation to come up, especially as we get into the spring season so soon um, and hummingbirds are starting to migrate back from Costa Rica. So uh, definitely something I can keep in mind if you guys are interested in that as well. Okay, I think we're coming to the end. Oh, okay, a better solution rather than putting them in the garden. Okay, so um, that, that question was just a follow up to uh, frogs ending up in your pool in the springtime. So frogs mate in this thing called a vernal pool, which is basically like a temporary pool of water that happens in the springtime. So if you've ever walked around Riverwood in the springtime, you've noticed there's a lot of like uh, wet puddles that are in the forested area. Those are called vernal pools and they will dry up eventually. Um, so these frogs are trying to grow up as fast as possible so that they can make it to maturity and before the water actually dries up. So often on their travels to a nearby pond or where they're going to be living most of their life is that they'll end up in your pool um, if they are a toad, in fact, they, they like the grassy land. So just putting them into your lawn would be best if it was a toad. But if it's a frog and you have a nearby pond, you can always put them near there as well. If that works, you can kind of just take a bucket down to the pond. All right. 
Well, I want to thank everyone for all of your questions today. And thank you for joining me. That was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And hopefully we will be back soon with more presentations for you guys. Um, if you do have any suggestions for presentations, or if you would like uh, me to come to one of your pres uh, your clubs or your meetings, um, you can always reach out to me at stephanie.keeler at the Riverwood Conservancy org and I can get back to you and, and hopefully do a presentation for you but thank you so much for all of the great questions and thank you for joining me today I hope you stay safe and have a great Valentine's Day everyone thanks so much